All right, I'm going to start with my opening scene for this story. <clears throat> it began with a conversation. Four young black men in their first year in North Carolina Agricultural and Technical College in a dormitory room discussing their hopes and their frustrations. It was late 1959, and then it was early 1960, and of the many topics they talked about in these bull sessions, the one they kept returning to was the challenge of leading a dignified life in the Jim Crow South. They talked and they talked some more. And then in a word of one of the students, we just got tired of talking about it and decided to do something. Late in the afternoon of February 1st, 1960, the four students entered the Woolworth store in downtown Greensboro. They purchased a few small items in the store and then sat down to lunch counter. I'm sorry, the waitress told them, we don't serve colored here. Like most department stores in the American South, the Greensboro Woolworths welcome black customers in all parts of the store, including the eating area, but with one restriction. They were not allowed to sit at the lunch counter. The students pointed out that they had just been served at the merchandise counter and they asked why they were being refused at this one. This is a public place, isn't it? Asked one of the students. If it isn't, then why don't you sell membership cards? If you do that, then I'll understand that this is a private concern. But they wouldn't serve us, one, one recounted. So we just sat there until lunch counter closed and then we came back to school. They returned the following morning, this time with reinforcements, 21 in total. They went through the same routine and they were refused again. They sat. The next morning, they were back again. The students sat in shifts throughout the day. They talked quietly among themselves. Some brought school books and used the time to keep up with their coursework. Police officers kept watch on the scene, as did local newspaper reporters. By the end of the week, an estimated 200 students had taken part in the Greensboro sit-ins. The Greensboro demonstrations were not the first time African-Americans protested discrimination at lunch counters or other eating facilities in this way. There's actually a history going back at least two decades before the Greensboro lunch counter sit-ins of sporadic sit-ins. In Chicago in the 1940s, there were some sit-ins in lunch counters, St. Louis in the early 1950s. Oklahoma City actually had a sort of mini sort of sit-in movement in the late 1950s. Miami had some sit-in protests in 1959. But what separated these sit-ins, the sit-ins that started in Greensboro, from all those that came before was what followed. These protests inspired others to sit in, to march, to picket, to organize boycotts, in some cases to go to jail, to be abused, and to be beaten. A week of remarkable events in Greensboro turned into an inspired assault on racial practices throughout the South. The sit-ins became a movement. On February 8th, just one week after the first sit-ins in Greensboro, we have sit-ins breaking out in Durham and Winston, North Carolina. Then a few days later, Charlotte, Raleigh, and other North Carolina cities also joined in, in the movement. February 11th, this is uh, just over a week after the first sit-ins, uh, the sit-ins spread outside of North Carolina. Hampton, Virginia was the first uh, city outside of North Carolina to have a sit-in protest. By the end of February, just one month into this movement, 30 cities and seven states saw sit-in protests. Just a month later, two months into the movement, this uh, protest had spread to 48 cities and 11 states. Major protests turned out to, uh, took place in Nashville, where 81 were arrested, Atlanta, where 77 were arrested. In all, when the movement ran its course uh, in the summer of 1960, an estimated 50,000 people took part in the sit-in movement. The number arrested for these courageous efforts would reach into the thousands. All right, at this point, I'm going to take a little bit of a break from the narrative to step back and talk some about the book, why I wrote this book and what I tried to do in this book, and then I'm going to return back to the, the history itself. So when I wrote this book, this book actually started off uh, as a, a seminar paper in law school. I wanted to write, there's some uh, court cases having to do with sit-in protests. I wanted to write a story about how protest movements can contribute to legal change in the courts. So I was gonna write a seminar paper and the seminar paper I thought was gonna involve me going out and reading the books. I thought there were gonna be a bunch of books out there on the sit-in movement, which was a major part of American history. And then I was going to link it up to some legal issues, write my seminar paper, and move on. 
to my surprise, when I went to the library and started doing the search for the books on the sit-in movement, I realized that there actually was not books and there's not a single book. There had not been a single book written dedicated specifically to the sit-in movement. So when I eventually decided to turn the seminar paper into some articles and eventually into a book, one of my goals here was simply to fill a gap. I thought we needed a book on the sit-ins. I also have an argument I advance in this book, and I am a law professor and a legal historian. So one of my key interests here is not just the protest movement, which is clearly at the centerpiece of the book, but also how the law played a key role in how this particular protest movement unfolded and what it achieved. So one of my arguments, my central argument of the book, is that we can't understand why the sit-ins happened and what they achieved without paying attention to the law, including some rather intricate areas of constitutional law, and I'll touch on that later in the talk. My book tells the story of the sit-ins with a particular focus on the legal issues involved from six different perspectives, and I dedicate a chapter to each of these perspectives. I start off where you have to start off with this story with the students. So I talk about what the students did, why they did what they did, and their experience. I then have a chapter dedicated to lawyers. These are civil rights lawyers who came down to try and rep to represent the students, to help the students, to work with the students, but they oftentimes didn't see eye to eye with what the students were trying to do. So I talked some about the lawyer's experience and some of the tensions and difficulties they had working on behalf of the students. I have a chapter which I call the sympathizers, which I talk about people who are sympathetic to the movement, not directly involved in the movement, but did work on the movement's behalf. And I focus in particular on people in positions of power and influence and the role that they played in moving the story forward. I have a chapter dedicated to the opponents, the people who stood up against the students' interests who were trying to defend principles of racial segregation during this um, this event. Then I moved to the U.S. Supreme Court. There was some major litigation that evolved out of the arrests and the sit-ins, and some of these cases actually got all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court in the early 1960s, and there's a series of quite dramatic court cases, and I give an inside story about what the court did with those cases. And then the last chapter of the book is called The Lawmakers, and that turns our focus to Congress, which is where this particular issue, the battle over racial segregation and lunch counters and other public accommodations, was eventually resolved. The culminating moment of this was the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, so I'm going to walk through these chapters. I'm going to give more attention to the students' chapter, but also just touch on the major themes of these other chapters to get a sense of the overall arc of the book, and then we'll um, have time for questions at the end. Starting off with the first chapter, focusing on the students. This chapter centers on the African-American students and their challenge of racial practices in the South. I focus in particular on three key questions. One was, why did they choose this particular tactic, this direct action protest tactic? I also think about why did they choose this particular target? Why lunch counters? And also about what they thought, what they uh, sought to achieve, what were their goals? So starting off with the question about why the tactic, why direct action protest? A lot of this actually had to do with dissatisfaction, not just to rage toward racial segregation and white supremacy, but also dissatisfaction toward traditional modes of resistance to white supremacy and racial segregation. This is very much a generational critique. Much of the motivation for the students' protest emerged from frustration that these students had, this younger generation had, toward more established leaders within the Black uh, civil rights community. A lot of these young people, these students, thought that their um, uh, their parents' generation, their grandparents' generation, uh, too easily accepted some of the practices of Jim Crow. According to Ezel Blair Jr., who's one of the Greensboro Four, he said, quote, many of our adults have been complacent and fearful, and it's time for someone to wake up and change the situation, and we decided to start here. Now, I have to say, uh, this critique was very powerful for motivating the students. They felt like they were charting out on this new journey. They're pushing back not only against racial segregation, but also against the older generation of Black Americans. It was not a fully fair critique. I mean, Ezra Blair's own parents actually were quite involved in social justice activism. It's also worth noting that their grandparents' generation, if they had tried anything close to this, the retribution they would have faced uh, in, say, the 1920s and 30s would have um, far surpassed anything that uh, these students had to deal with in terms of the backlash by the, the segregationists. So I think this critique needs to be understood as a powerful mobilizing tool, but just in terms of the accuracy of the critique, I think it was um, 
not fully fair to the obstacles and challenges that their parents and grandparents faced. This is also a tactical critique. The students were frustrated not only with the older generation for not doing enough, but also with the choices the older generation tended to make in terms of how they fought against white supremacy and racial segregation. Many saw this form of direct action protest as an alternative to the dominant modes of racial protest of the older generation, which was mostly litigation, court cases, and lobbying, arguing for change statutes. A key figure here is a man named James Lawson, who was one of the leaders of the national movement, which is a very uh, well-developed student uh, movement. And he uh, argued that the direct action protest was an alternative to litigation. And his de defining characteristic of his vision about how this was going to work was skepticism or even antagonism toward litigation as a pathway to racial justice. The younger generation of protesters saw courts as something to be avoided not necessarily because they might lose in court, but because even if they won in court, they were skeptical that real change would follow. And here we need to understand something about the place of Brown versus Board of Education in the psyche of these uh, this younger generation of protesters who are involved in the sit-in movement. Brown versus Board of Education was a Supreme Court decision in 1954 that ruled mandatory racial segregation in schools to be unconstitutional. This is a dramatic victory for the civil rights community, for Thurgood Marshall, the NAACP. I'll return to Thurgood Marshall. He features prominently in my story as well. This major victory in 1954, and it held out a lot of hope for a lot of people that change was going to happen. And it's important to note, if you think about the age of the students who took part in the sit-in protests, there, most of them were college students at this time. They were old enough to understand what was going on six years before this. They were in middle school, maybe beginning high, uh, high school. And many of them had hopes that when Brown versus Board of Education came down, things were going to change. Now, if you know something about the politics of race and segregation in the post-Brown era, nothing changed, at least in the Deep South, for about 10 years after Brown versus Board of Education. The White South put up a, um, obstacles to actually desegregating the schools. This is called massive resistance. They blocked any efforts to desegregate the schools. So for a lot of these students who grew up in the South, they Brown happened, this great victory in the Supreme Court. Nothing actually changed on the ground. So Brown was actually a symbol of hopefulness for some, but also a symbol of the limitations of courts and litigation. So when a lot of them looked for things that they could actually do, they didn't think about necessarily going to law school and making winning court cases or working for the NAACP. They saw this as an alternative, something that could actually have a different approach. Okay, so that was why they chose this particular tactic. How about the target? Why did they choose these lunch counters? Discriminatory treatment at lunch counters exacted a particularly abrasive psychic cost for many Black Americans. And it was felt particularly strongly by the younger Black Americans. It was a raw personal experience of exclusion from these department store lunch counters, not necessarily any specific legal claim that pulled these protesters toward this particular target. Yet I'll say here, the law also played a background, background role because one reason this target was so inviting for the students was that the established civil rights groups, such as the NAACP and Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference, were actually not focusing very much on public accommodations as a target for racial justice activism in 1960. They were focused mostly on schools, that's what the post-Brown efforts were focused on, and on voting rights. They weren't focusing on public accommodations. And then one of the key reasons they weren't but because lawyers, when they looked at this particular issue, thought that this is not a very inviting target to make strong legal challenges. They felt like the Constitution and statutes that are out there to allow them to challenge racial segregation in schools, to challenge exclusion from voting. But when it came to these public accommodations, the legal issues were a bit trickier. Therefore, the established groups weren't focusing much attention on them. But that also created a target of opportunity for the younger generation, because here was an area which they could identify, which is a very powerful uh, symbol of racial segregation, but it was one in which there wasn't a lot of activism focused on it. So it was sort of an open target for them. They could frame their protests as being independent and authentic and being detached from these established groups. And that was really powerful for energizing this movement. Goals. What were these students trying to achieve? They had quite lofty aspirational goals. But they also had very much down-to-earth goals. And a key point here 
is that this protest approach could produce immediate tangible results. And this is, I'll just distinguish it from say, if you're doing litigation, you're trying to get through the uh, you know, litigation process, that takes months and years to get done. This particular protest had results that they could see immediately in some circumstances. And this is a crit critical ingredient for the movement, for mobilizing the movement. It was empowering. Uh, it really gave them a real sense of boldness. I'm just going to go back to this quote, which I really like from uh, Diane Nash, one of the Nashville protesters, leaders of the Nashville protest, in which she tried to sort of capture this idea that they're going to win simply by doing these protests. So what did she mean when she said, we will win? Well, clearly they want to change the world. They want to change society, but also there is these smaller steps they could have that they can interpret as victories. For example, one of the most common responses of a lunch counter when these protests took place was to simply shut down a lunch counter. Now that doesn't seem like a great big victory, but think about it. If you're a student and you go out there and you go and you protest an injustice that's taking place and the response of this business is to simply shut down. They're not making any money. They shut down, they turn off the lights. A lot of times the students would leave the, the uh, lunch counter and chant in the streets that they had just won. They would celebrate a victory simply from having this lunch counter shut down. Sometimes they could actually persuade the operator of a lunch counter to change their policy, particularly if it's just an independent store. Sometimes there's a single decision maker. And oftentimes that person, perhaps moved by the moral power of the protest, perhaps simply moved by the fact that they weren't making money when the protests were taking place. But for whatever reason, sometimes they could actually persuade individual proprietors to change policies. And sometimes a protest early on in the protest movement could actually get communities to change. Oftentimes businesses would get together. They'd say, this is taking place in our city. What do we do? And oftentimes the businesses wanted to make a decision together. So this would be a community-wide decision. And we do see in places like Nashville and Greensboro, North Carolina, you do have community-wide commitment by the business community at some point after the protest started to say enough, we are going to change our policies. We will serve on a non-discriminatory basis in these public accommodations. This is all directly from what the students were doing. It didn't involve uh, formal legal change. It didn't really involve lawyers. It simply involved a protest doing their work and getting people to change their actions. Also, the protest could often be an end into itself. Sometimes the protesters simply felt like they were winning by the act of protesting. Sometimes they felt like they were winning when they were arrested. And a lot of these students were arrested. And sometimes for them, this itself was also a victory. When they got arrested, sometimes they were refused to be released on um, bail and they'd sit in jail. And they had this mantra of jail, no bail. And the idea here is that when they were sitting in jail, they were actually expanding the platform of their protests because when they're in jail, they're actually a very powerful lesson to the community outside about the, the goals that they're aiming for. Sometimes when they were convicted of various crimes like trespassing or disorderly conduct, they would choose to serve their sentences rather than pay a fine, again, trying to elevate the protest to a new level by basically taking the punishment that was served to them. So this is the students. This is their, their goals and what they tried to achieve and also why they targeted this. Let me just move through the other major protagonists of my story. <clears throat> so I have a chapter dedicated to the civil rights lawyers. Um, this turns to their often uneasy relationship with the uh, students. And I focus particularly on the lawyers of the National Association for Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, and their legal branch was headed by Thurgood Marshall, the man who was um, one of the leading lawyers responsible for Brown versus Board of Education. Thurgood Marshall would also go on to be the first black solicitor general of the United States and then the first black Supreme Court justice when Lyndon Johnson was appointed in 1967. So clearly one of the, uh, the legends of our uh, legal history. He was also involved in the um, sit-in protest and that he was heading the legal branch of the NAACP when the sit-in protest took off. The students and the lawyers, they struggled to come to terms. Ultimately, they were basically on the same side of the issue. They all were fighting against racial segregation and injustice. But they didn't quite see eye to eye in terms of how the protests were happening. When a protest began, these lawyers uh, were mostly working on school desegregation suits, but they weren't going particularly well. This is after the initial euphoria, Brown versus Board of Education, and they were kind of stuck. This is six years after Brown stuck in what one of the lawyers described as trench warfare with these southern uh, school districts that were just trying to slow up the whole process of desegregation. They didn't really feel like they were getting anywhere all that fast. So lawyers really struggled to make sense of what was happening when the student protests broke out. 
Initially, some of these lawyers actually saw the sit-ins as a problem. They saw it as something to be managed. Some of the lawyers, Thurgood Marshall in particular, actually, were skeptical about direct action protests generally. They basically thought that the way you change society was by changing laws, by winning in court and by passing new laws, and that these protests really was not the main where the main action was. They also had some doubts about the constitutional basis for what the students were protesting. And I'm just going to touch on this legal issue, and I'm happy to return to this later and talk if people are curious about this. The basic idea they were uncertain about how strong a legal claim these students had had to do with what's called the state action doctrine, which relates to the 14th Amendment, which is a key constitutional provision on which the NAACP and the civil rights community really made most of the victory. This is a provision of the Constitution that was the basis for Brown versus Board of Education and a lot of the other major racial justice victories that took place in the courts. So the question is, could this provision of the Constitution also protect the interests of these Black students when they protested against racial segregation in these public accommodations. The basic issue here, and the reason that this issue was, as a legal matter, much trickier for lawyers to navigate than, say, school segregation, was that the lunch counters were operated by private actors. And constitutional rights generally just limit what are called state actors. And if you look at the language I have highlighted here, the 14th Amendment's equal protection provision does identify the limits of the equal protection provision applying to the state and state actors, government actors, just to generalize beyond that. So based on the text of the 14th Amendment, as well as longstanding judicial precedent, the 14th Amendment only applied to government. And people running these public accommodations were, in most cases, not government actors. The Woolworths is a private business, not a government actor, and therefore they argued the 14th Amendment doesn't apply to us. We can choose who we want to serve, uh, and we're not constrained by the Constitution. Now, if this lunch counter was a public facility, say a lunch counter based in a courthouse, then clearly they would need to abide by the limits of this because that would be a state actor, a government facility, and they would have to meet the equal protection requirements. If there's a law that said that black people cannot sit next to white people at lunch counters, then that clearly would meet the state action requirement because in this case, it would be the official policy of the state. And that could be challenged, particularly after Brown versus Board of Education is a violation of the 14th Amendment. The tricky thing here was that places like North Carolina, they didn't actually have laws dictating racial segregation in these public accommodations. The policies, the racial segregation policies that the students were challenging were not by formal law, but they were by private business decisions. And then the question was, could they use a 14th Amendment to combat that? The lawyers basically were uncertain. They were skeptical. There's a strong legal claim here. It did get more complicated when the business owners called the police to come in and to enforce trespassing or disorderly conduct or some other laws against the students, because then you do have the government getting involved. But there's some, some tricky legal issues there because the government's getting involved, not enforcing racial segregation policy, but enforcing trespassing or disorderly conduct policy, which is not racially discriminatory per se. It just gets really tricky. And the lawyers were working so hard to fight their other battles they weren't quite sure this is a battle they were going to win. So these factors, again, a lot of complicated law here, um, but in the end, these factors contributed to people like Thurgood Marshall being skeptical of the students' claim initially. Thurgood Marshall, in fact, went down to Greensboro, talked to the students down there, and basically said to them at one point, you've done your work, you've got your protest, we now have cases, and now we can deal with them. And the students just were like, you know, Thurgood Marshall just didn't understand what they were doing because it was not about giving lawyers cases. It was about doing the protest itself. Eventually, the lawyers were able to find legal arguments that they felt like they could take to court. And we do actually eventually have litigation, never quite victorious in the Supreme Court, but the NWCP was able to put together a legal defense trying to argue that these lunch counters should actually be covered by the 14th Amendment. But again, the law was uncertain during this period. Ultimately, the lawyers and students settled into a tense but functional relationship is how I describe it in the book. <clears throat> All right, the third chapter looks to what I call the sympathizers. These are uh, mostly white liberal figures, but also some uh, black figures. I put Martin Luther King in this category because he was involved tangentially in the sit-in movement, but he is really much more influential in talking about the sit-ins and their significance to broader audiences. And this is trying to figure out how the country at large understood the sit-in movement, and particularly how people could frame the sit-in movement in a somewhat sympathetic way. So this chapter focuses on people who express support, 
for the students and their right. And I consider it an eclectic cast of characters from the President of the United States to civil rights leaders to ordinary citizens and how they understood the protest movement. And one of the things I was really curious about was about how a lot of people had very strong claims that what the students were doing was constitutionally protected, just like back fighting against segregation in schools or fighting for voting rights. And even though the lawyers would stand in there and say, no, it's actually much more complicated than that. In the end, having this what's sometimes called popular constitutional claim, maybe not technically correct, but quite morally powerful, eventually created pressure on the law to change, to align itself with how the, the, um, the general population was understanding this particular provision of the Constitution. Basically, the idea here that I pursue is that enough people accept a plausible but technically wrong legal claim, the law will often respond to try and then meet to fix itself, to, to, to meet that particular claim. So the student's constitutional claim actually was strengthened simply by virtue of so many people uh, embracing the claim, even when the lawyers were less certain. Uh, I have to say, if I had to identify the chapter that was most interesting and surprising for me to write, it would probably be this chapter, the chapter I titled The Opponents, where I'm basically looking, if you look at this picture in front of you, I'm looking at the police officer behind the students and looking at the lunch counter owner standing in front of the students. What did they think they're doing and what were they doing? And this became really interesting to me because one of the things about the sit-in movement that is somewhat different from, say, the school desegregation battle is that those who oppose the movement, and here I'm talking about the lunch kind of operators, the police, but also Southern political leaders, as well as just some racist uh, ideologues, sort of different categories I look at, they were quite divided. They were not united. The school, the Brombers Board of Education united the white South to stand up against desegregation, stand up in defense of racial segregation. The sit-in protest fractured these groups of opponents. They couldn't really get together in terms of what they wanted to do here, and the students were able to take advantage of that. A lot of the success of the sit-in movement actually came from the fact that the opposition was uncertain. They were divided. They were not united on this particular issue, and it was not an effective opposition, and the students were able to achieve a lot because of that. So one of my goals here is to break down this category of people, sometimes called segregationists, which is sort of a monolithic group, and to break them into different parts and say how different members of this group had different uh, ideas about what to do with the sit-ins. And my argument here is that one of the reasons for the division among Southern whites and one of the reasons it's so consequential for the sit-in movement was because of distinct, distinctive legal issues of racial discrimination at lunch counters. Law amplified divisions between different people, and law made these divisions more significant. And the idea here is that there is a misalignment between people who had incentives to crack down on the sit-ins, to punish the sit-in protesters, and the people who actually had authority to do so. Those who most wanted to use the law to crack down on the students were often unable to do so. If you look at uh, you know, this picture here, like I pretty much feel like this police officer in this picture really wants to send these kids to jail. He wants to take these kids in. They're causing disruption. He's ready to bring them in. If you look at Southern politicians, they also were often campaigning saying we need to shut down these protests. They're not good for society, for Southern society. We need to protect ourselves. A lot of the Southern politicians during this period were voted in in the post Brown era in which you had much more radical, committed white supremacists put into power. They generally wanted to crack down on it. But the thing here is that in order to get these students, uh, to put these students in jail, it's not just dependent on the police officer because they're not doing anything disruptive here. And this is a place in which they had no laws saying that what they're doing is legal. What you required here was the other person, the person across the counter, this proprietor, he had to make a decision to press trespassing charges saying these people are on private property and they're trespassing. Uh, sometimes they would say yes arrest the people. But oftentimes the proprietors, the business people were hesitant to call in the law, the full force of the law. They did plenty of times. I said before, the numbers of people who got arrested did eventually measure in the thousands. But that's compared to some 50,000 people who took part in the protest. Most people who took part in the protest did not, were not subjected to criminal prosecution for their actions. A key reason was that these business owners, they saw the writing on the wall. There were sizable black populations in their communities. They knew that their businesses, the economic success did depend at least in part on having good relationships or at least you know, serviceable relationships with the black community and throwing these kids in jail was not a good business decision. And they're often hesitant to do so. So we have a situation that this picture captures, which is a standoff in a lot of these situations. The people who want to use the law 
were the ones who uh, were in, unable to start the legal process in many of these situations. And the business managers and also local government officials oftentimes were hesitant. In Greensboro, the mayor didn't really want to crack down on the protests because they're trying to attract more businesses. They're trying to, especially particularly in the upper south, a lot of these upper southern cities are trying to attract northern business investment. And um, you know, the white supremacist racial segregation practices were not great for that in 1960. So you had divisions. You had divisions, and the students were able to enter into that divided situation and actually get these protests off the ground in a way that they wouldn't have if the full if the white South was fully committed to cracking down on what was going on here. So although many protests were uh, arrested, most were not. And this did also lead to some early concessions in some of these Southern cities. Nashville had a major agreement in May that ended segregation. Greensboro's major agreement took place in July. All right, now we're moving more into the, uh, the legal story here. And we'll start off with what happened at the court. In this chapter, I examine the Supreme Court's confrontation with appeals of prosecutions that resulted from the sit-ins. Today, these line of cases are largely forgotten, but at the time, the justices and many legal commentators believed these cases could be as significant as Brown versus Board of Education. But ultimately, the sit-in cases were uh, one of the great aberrations of the Warren Court, this court that you see in front of you. The Warren Court was famous for pushing forward uh, with civil rights issues, supporting the civil rights movement, oftentimes making new laws in support of the civil rights movement, not only in Brown, but in a whole line of cases. But in the cases involving sit-in protests, they didn't make new law. They were quite hesitant to do so. So much of this chapter is trying to explain why a court that was generally quite sympathetic to the interests, in fact, was sympathetic to the interests of the students, was hesitant to actually embrace the claim that they were pursuing and their lawyers were pursuing, which was that they're constitutionally uh, protected, that constitutional right to be served in these public accommodations. The court eventually found ways to side with the students, overturning disorderly conduct or trespassing convictions, but often doing so on narrow grounds, avoiding the great big looming constitutional issue. Um, the big case, the big showdown case, was a case called Bell versus Maryland. If you look at the date there, it does reinforce the point I brought up earlier. This is four years after the sit-in started, so this just shows you how slow the process is for a lot of these legal issues. By this point, the people who are involved in these protests often didn't even really, weren't really keeping track of what was going on here. It's a very slow process here, which is why the students were searching for alternatives to this. But ultimately, you do have a decision in Bell versus Maryland in which you have shifting alliances of the justices, and I detail how they were shifting all over the place. It was 5-4, then 4-5, and eventually you get a decision. If you look at this, it was a 3-3-3 decision. The court fractured all over the place. Long and the short of it is the Warren Court, this great defender of the cause of civil rights during the 1960s, were unable to come to a clear agreement on this particular issue of the uh, constitutional status of racial discrimination in public accommodations. Some justices, such as William Douglas, one of the giants of his era, thought that they should clearly uh, come in there and just tell rule in um, favor of the students. They say, this is our job to deal with this problem. We shouldn't hand this off to others. Another justice of the time, also a giant figure of the Supreme Court during his tenure on the court, he had a very different view. He and Justice Douglas were usually side by side on a lot of civil liberties issues, but on this particular issue, they are completely different. Douglas wanted to side of the students. Hugo Black said, no, these are violent uh, actions and we cannot condone violent actions. And there's a real irony, if you look at Justice Black's quote here, what made the sit-in so powerful as a form of protest was that they were bold, that they took formal or they took action against established authority in this really attention-getting way. That very same characteristic that made them so powerful as a form of protest was basically what Justice Black saw as making their legal claim weak, as making their legal claim dangerous, that they were in fact too bold, taking action against established authority. And basically, he's implying here that if you want to challenge racial segregation, there's a way to do it. You go to court, you get a lawyer. You don't make these protests in a speech because once you start engaging in violence or actions that encourage violence because there was violent retribution against the last sitting protest, that this is just a road toward disorder. And that's something that the courts cannot condone. And therefore, we, the court, cannot condone what they did.
Then I move in my final chapter to lawmakers with centers on the U.S. Congress. And this is where the eventual resolution of this issue that the students uh, sparked back in February 1st, 1960, uh, got its, final, its resolution. I turn to the people who crafted the Civil Rights Act of 1964, because with this landmark legislation, Congress prohibited racial discrimination in public accommodations across the nation. I ex examine how this claim that emerged from the social protest movement of the sit-ins some four years earlier was eventually translated into this transformative piece of legislation. The politics behind the Civil Rights Act were incredibly difficult. It took years to mobilize support for it. A lot of the story had to do with uh, a piece of legislation that was proposed by John F. Kennedy in the spring of 1963 and uh, the face of pro major protests going on in Birmingham. Kennedy comes out supports nationwide civil rights legislation that would include a provision applying to public accommodations. John F. Kennedy was, of course, assassinated in the fall of 1963 when this legislation was stalled, but then his successor, Lyndon Johnson, used Kennedy's assassination as a sort of moral justification for why they needed to push the civil rights through. He said this would be a testament to the legacy of the fallen president, and he used this as well as Johnson's legislative skills to get this through Congress. But again, this was proposed in the spring of 1963. Johnson would eventually sign it on July 4th, 1964. It took almost a year to get through, including a filibuster in the Senate. One of those themes I focus on here was the difficulty trying to identify what the right constitutional basis for congressional authority was in this case, which also comes back to some of the legal issues I talked about before. But eventually, the 1964 Civil Rights Act did include what's called Title II, the second major provision of the, the Civil Rights Act. And Title II of the 64 Civil Rights Act prohibited racial segregation in businesses that serve the public. Uh, this included hotels as well as restaurants and applied to all the lunch counters that were the target of the protests, the sit-in movement in 1960. This provision not only became law, but to the surprise of many at the time, it soon became a broadly accepted norm of conduct for the nation. In contrast to the white Southern resistance of school desegregation after the Brown decision, there was actually pretty significant compliance with this particular provision. And a lot of that had to do with one, the effects of the protest movement. The protest movement did change people's views. It did change people's hearts and minds in a way that a single court opinion can't do. And also the economic incentives. Eventually, a lot of these business owners just recognized that, you know, even if they made the change grudgingly, it was a good business decision eventually to abandon their commitment to racial segregation. It's generally effective implementation, stands in contrast to school desegregation, as well as some other desegregation battles, including in the workplace, which have been much stickier to try to resolve. This is not to say that discrimination in public accommodations, at least racial discrimination in public accommodations, simply went away. But if you look at the major battles of the civil rights era, I do think this one is clearly on the scales of much more success than, say, battles for equality and education, and even voting rights has run into some significant barriers of late. Let me just wrap up with a section from the conclusion of my book, and then we'll see if we have some discussion and questions. <clears throat> the resolution of the issue first given prominence by the students sitting at lunch counters in the winter of 1960 was one of the greatest achievements of the civil rights era. My book is in part an effort to celebrate the sit-in movement and the legal battles over discrimination and public accommodations that the movement sparked. It's an effort to draw attention to this triumphant moment in our ongoing struggle for racial justice and to better understand why this campaign for social and legal change worked while so many others did not. Today, our challenge is to find new ways to combine social protest and legal claims to disrupt those practices and policies that perpetuate old injustices and create new ones. The sit-in movement shows that it can be done.